Good morning and welcome to our recorded service for Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is of course when we remember Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem and the acclamation of the crowds as he entered the city. But we also take the opportunity to look ahead to the events of the coming week, Holy Week, of Maundy Thursday, the Last Supper, Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, the cross. We fill in the gap, as it were, if you like, between Palm Sunday and the resurrection on Easter Sunday. So we'll be bringing those things into the service this morning. And so now let's begin with our opening response. Hosanna to the Son of David, the King of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And now we listen to the Palm Gospel. The reading is taken from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. The triumphant entry into Jerusalem. As they approached Jerusalem, near the towns of Bethphage and Bethany, they came to the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples on ahead with these instructions. Go to the village there ahead of you. As soon as you get there, you will find a colt tied up that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if someone asks you why you are doing that, Tell them that the master needs it and will send it back at once. So they went and found a colt out in the street, tied to the door of a house. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders asked them, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered just as Jesus had told them, and the men let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus threw their cloaks over the animal, and Jesus got on. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches in the fields and spread them on the road. The people who were in front and those who followed behind began to shout, Praise God! God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless the coming kingdom of King David, our Father. Praise God. Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple and looked round at everything. But since it was already late in the day, he went out to Bethany with the twelve disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Now, maybe you've had the opportunity to pick up a palm cross this year, or maybe you've made one, or maybe you've got one saved from um, last year or even longer ago. Um, this is one that lives in the pocket of Heather's Bible that uh, we got crosses like this a few years ago. And they were actually made, they're stitched by uh, ladies who uh, did so in Sri Lanka. But if you have a cross to hand, would you like to hold it now as we pray the blessing of the palms? God our Saviour, whose Son Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem as Messiah to suffer and to die. May these palms be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our King and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. And now we sing, make way, make way for Christ the King.
pray the collect for Palm Sunday. Almighty and everlasting God, who in your tender love towards the human race sent your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross, grant that we may follow the example of his patience and humility and also be made partakers of his resurrection through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Now we come to our time of confession, just an opportunity to place ourselves honestly and humbly before God and to receive the forgiveness that Christ won for us on the cross. God shows his love for us in that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us show our love for him by confessing our sins in penitence and faith. God our Father, we are sorry that we have done wrong. We have often forgotten you. We have often been selfish instead of loving others. For these and all our sins, forgive us, we pray, and help us to follow the example of Jesus more nearly. Through his name we pray. Amen. And so, may the Father forgive us by the death of the Son, and strengthen us to live in the power of his Spirit, now and always. Amen. And now we listen to our second and third readings, and then Holly is going to share some thoughts on the Passion of our Lord. The second reading is from Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. He made himself nothing, laid aside his mighty power and glory, and took the humble position of a slave and appeared in human form. And in human form, he obediently humbled himself even further by dying a criminal's death on a cross. Because of this, God raised him up to the heights of heaven and gave him a name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. The third reading is taken from Mark chapter 14, starting at verse 53. They took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. 
The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another not made with hands. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked, Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, Prophesy! And the guards took him and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene, Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. Again he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you are talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Bar Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff, and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. 
A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. This is the word of the Lord. It's lovely to be with you on this Palm Sunday. And we've been really blessed this morning with lots of passages from Scripture to really nourish us. And we've heard things that are really rich in connection with Old Testament prophecy, which Jesus fulfilled. So there's plenty to choose from, what to go deeper with. And we know that whenever God's word goes out, his spirit is at work in the hearts and the minds of those listening. Nothing is replicated. Everything is unique. So let us pray now. God, we ask that you would speak to us wherever we are, however we're feeling. May you speak to us personally, but also speak to us as a church, as a united family of God. Amen. And this morning I want to go deeper with the aloneness of Jesus' passionate sacrifice for us. This was something that struck me afresh during my preparation. 
it struck a chord with me and the aloneness that I felt at times during the last year not being able to meet with you um, to worship uh, with the body of Christ. And today we begin our ascent. It's the start of Holy Week. In my mind, I picture Palm Sunday at the foot of a very steep mountain. And I imagine this is maybe how Jesus might have felt. From the descriptions of the celebration of his entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the dominating emotion in the crowd is one of joy. It's festival time, there is excitement about Jesus' arrival, there's always hope um, at festival time, how they remember um, how God rescued them um, at the Passover. And not long before, um, Jesus had healed Lazarus and perhaps some people in the crowd would have been there and witnessed that and would have you know, high expectations of this man who was arriving at this festival time. Um, and healing of Lazarus is a bit of an understatement. If you've read the story, um, he had been dead for a few days and Jesus brings him back to life. He walks out of uh, the tomb covered in bandages. Um, so pretty amazing stuff. And it's quite likely um, that Jesus was staying with Lazarus and his sisters, uh, Mary and Martha, um, at this time. Now, I think we can say with confidence that there was not a deeper level of understanding among the crowd or even among the disciples at the start of this week about what was happening. Jesus might be surrounded by welcoming crowds and all his followers, but he alone knows what is coming. He stands at the foot of the Palm Sunday mountain, gets on the back of a borrowed donkey and fixes his eyes on the summit, alone in his spiritual understanding of his true identity and his mission. His disciples follow his instructions, but we know from previous conversations when Jesus had plainly told them that he must suffer and die. And we've heard in our readings when he's arrested, they do not have that deeper understanding of what is waiting for Jesus at the top of the mountain. So let's move on to the contrasting situation that followed this joyful entry, Jesus's arrest. Just a few days later, Jesus is alone. He is deserted. Just as he said would happen, the disciples scatter. And in Mark's gospel, we hear only of Peter cautiously following at a distance. But when confronted, quickly denies any affiliation with the man that is alone on trial before the high priest. I don't know this man that you're talking about, Peter replies in verse 71. This man, this man Jesus, Peter, we might think to ourselves, how can you say this? When Jesus had looked into Peter's eyes and asked Peter back in chapter 8, verse 29, who do you say I am? Peter had replied, you are the Messiah. My study Bible suggests that Peter, like many others, was incomplete in his understanding of who Jesus was. He believed that Jesus was God's chosen leader to deliver the Jewish people from Roman oppression. This was the hope as Jesus arrived on Palm Sunday. That was the culture that was consuming their lives. 
when Jesus told Peter in verse 30, uh, just before being arrested, that he would deny him, Peter replied, even if I have to die with you, I would never disown you. It's quite easy to feel disappointed in Peter, but we have the bigger picture. And anyway, how could God have allowed anyone else to die with Jesus? Jesus alone had to be the one, the only one that went to the cross. And to be sure, it is a mind-blowing concept to get our heads around. The creator of the universe, the one who heals the blind, raises the dead, walks on water, would need to die. It didn't make sense to his closest friends. It didn't make sense to the Jewish leaders that studied uh, the religious writings. It didn't make sense to the Romans. They were so consumed with the here and now. And Jesus did care about the here and now. And he demonstrated that when he spent time with people, healing the sick, listening to them, and particularly spending time with those that thought they were too far gone, uh, people that were overlooked and undervalued. And when Jesus met with these people, he saw them and he valued all that they were in that moment and all that he knew they were created to be. And what would have happened if Jesus and all his disciples had been crucified on Good Friday as rebels, a threat to Roman rule, as interfering in the teaching of religious law? That was just not God's plan. The Christian faith would not have got started if this had been the case. Indeed, the disciples would suffer for Christ, as do many brothers and sisters today who are persecuted for their faith. But on Good Friday, history was made when Jesus acted alone to finish the human part of his ministry, showing people what God was like, how far God would go for them. Who can forgive sins but God alone? These were the accusations and the ponderings of the teachers of the law when Jesus healed the paralysed man, as Mark tells us back in chapter 2, verse 7. No one but God can bring us back into relationship with God. Sin is a word that puts us on edge it took me quite a while to hear this word and not recoil. It wasn't until someone helped me understand with a bow and arrow analogy that I began to feel more comfortable with this word, explaining that the translation and original meaning would have been missing the target, missing the mark. And it was easy for me to see how I miss the target, miss the mark in lots of trivial ways. And that helped me to realise the biggest sin, the missing of the identity of my creator and failing to let him into my life. And when we read how Jesus heals the paralysed man physically and spiritually, he poses this question to us. Are we only interested in the here and now? Can we open our spiritual eyes and see that this is not all there is? By forgiving the man's spiritual sin, he's turning away from God. The gates to eternal life are opened as it was always meant to be. Jesus was alone in his spiritual understanding as he ascended the mountain on which he would be crucified, the place of the skull. 
Now, a few years ago, I had a conversation with someone who was exploring the Christian faith. And it really uh, has stuck with me and reminded me of my own understanding of the church as an institution before coming to faith. I get it, they said. You want more people to come to church so you can collect in more money and do more good work with it. I think that's a good thing. No, I said, that's not it. They looked at me puzzled. There is one reason alone we want more people to come to church. It's so they can hear about what Jesus has done for them personally. To get to know the God that made them so that they might know him now and eternally. The good work the church does is an expression of love for God in response to what Jesus has done. It's an attempt, and sometimes, you know, just an attempt to fulfill our role as humans to care for God's creation. Conversations like this often lead to more questions. The journey of faith is lifelong and full of questions we should never stop asking. And during the first lockdown, in particular, there were times I felt alone in my faith. I have my wonderful family around me, um, but I was so used to being part of a big body of believers, a crowd of witness, praying together, singing together, sharing what the Lord was doing in each other's lives. I felt so much purpose in serving the Lord alongside others in ways that I was used to. I had routines of private prayer, but I soon realised how much I needed to dig deeper into my personal relationship with God. And I found contemplative Ignatius prayer particularly helpful. This is when we listen or read passages of scripture and we try and picture ourselves at the scene. We try and inhabit the story. And you can do this by picturing yourself as one of the characters within the story. Or you can ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you, reveal whom you identify with in that moment, where you might be standing. We might have a conversation with someone in the story. Jesus might look at us. He might speak to us, ask us a question, and we might ask him a question. This contemplative prayer can be really powerful and it can help us discern what God might be saying to us. So I'd like to invite you to try this way of reading and praying through scripture this holy week, starting today, together. There are six chapters remaining in Mark's Gospel from Palm Sunday through to Easter Sunday. Why not follow the man on the donkey all the way from the foot of the steep mountain to the top? Enter into the spiritual understanding of what he alone was doing. When you get to the top of the mountain, the intense and sorrowful occasion of Good Friday. You might identify with the disciples that were broken and lost. And there's a short but graphic YouTube video called It's Friday But Sunday's Coming. And it's got clips from the films um, The Passion of the Christ and Risen and for me, it really brings the journey through Holy Week to life. Uh, so I recommend that to you. Um, but just be aware that the crucifixion scenes are pretty gruesome. 
um, but as the name of the video um, suggests, it's only Friday, Sunday's coming, and it builds up to Sunday. So when we're in a hard place, consumed by all that is going on around us, we need to remember Jesus is here with us now by his spirit. We are not alone. But also the deeper eternal perspective, Sunday's coming. As you read chapter 16, Jesus has risen. Listen to the voice of the angel in the empty tomb when they say to the woman, don't be alarmed. He has risen. Go and tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you. He says this to us today. Don't be alarmed. Widen your gaze. Run down the mountain. Back to Jerusalem back into Wadhurst and tell others what he's done for you. He especially wants to gather people that think that it's too late. He emphasises, tell Peter, he must have been at rock's bottom. It's never too late. You are never too far from God. As Jesus said, the first will be last and the last will be first. God is with you now by his spirit in this time, in this place, and he's gone ahead of you. So let us finish by practicing this Ignatius style of prayer. And this is taken from Ignatian Spirituality website. So let's close our eyes and put ourselves at the foot of the mountain. It's Palm Sunday. Imagine, it's a beautiful spring day. The sun is shining, the air is warm and the sense of new life surrounds you. You are walking along a narrow path in a large city that you have visited many times. You love this place. The small narrow streets crowded with people, the marketplace with its smells and noises. As you walk, you see a crowd forming along the street in front of you. It looks like they're lining the street for some reason. You wonder what's going on. So you walk towards the street. When you get closer, you can hear people chanting, but you can't make out the words. They seem to be waving something up and down. When you get to the street, there are many, many people smiling and waving large palm branches. Some have put their cloaks on the ground. There must be some royalty or wealthy person. They must be coming, you think. You look down the street and a few feet away is a man sitting on a donkey. He's waving to the crowd, but his face is so serious, almost sad. You get to the front of the crowd so that you can see him more closely. He stops in front of you. He looks at you. You recognise him. It's Jesus. He's the one everyone's been talking about. Jesus speaks to you. What does he say? What do you say to Jesus?
Jesus lingers there for a few minutes. He seems like he wants to get off the donkey to stay with you. To enter the main part of the city. But he doesn't move. He sits there looking at you. The crowd's voices get louder and louder. They are yelling out, praising him, saying, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. But Jesus doesn't seem happy. He reaches down for your hand. You reach up and hold Jesus' hand. What do you say to Jesus? What does he say to you? Thank you, Jesus. In you alone, our hope is found. Help us to journey with you this week into a deeper spiritual understanding of your passion for us. Amen. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the
And now let us affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now Michael leads us in a time of prayer. We see the amazing power of our God in the events of Palm Sunday and Holy Week, an almighty God. And yet our God is also a God who knows and loves each one of us personally, all our hopes and our fears and every hair on our head. And he loves us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross so that we may each be saved and receive his gift of eternal life. Almighty God, we thank you for your amazing love and we bring our prayers before you now with thankful hearts and in the sure knowledge that you hear our prayers and act on them as you have promised us. Let us pray for our world and your creation. Thank you, God, for the world you have created and for placing us in such a beautiful part of it. We are sorry that our care for your world falls so far short of what it should be. And we see all around us the consequences of our actions. Put into our hearts, we pray, the will to change this and guide each one of us to play our part in making this happen. We pray for wisdom and leadership among the nations to work together so that those who come after us may also see and enjoy the beauty of your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our country and the Queen and her family, our government and all those in authority. Lord, May your wisdom guide our leaders in the decisions they must make. May they work together with a unity of purpose to do what is right and to seek the common good. Strengthen and encourage them in the tasks they face and help us to be ready to forgive when things go wrong as you are quick to forgive us. We thank you for the success of the vaccines and for those who have developed them. And we pray that you'll guide our leaders to ensure they are distributed fairly, not just to the rich countries, but also to the poor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our children and young people. And we thank you that our schools can now be open again and for all the teachers, staff, parents and children who face many challenges resulting from the long closures during lockdown. We pray that you will guide them, encourage them and strengthen them in the vital work they do in lovingly teaching and building up these children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our church. Father, we pray for the many millions of your people around the world, united in love for you. Help each one of us to play our own part in bringing your light and love to situations where we find injustice, inequality and hatred, and raise up peacemakers that your love may overcome in these situations. We thank you for Paul and for all our ministry team in our three churches. 
and for their leadership, teaching and preaching. We pray that your Spirit will continue to inspire them and guide them as they lead us week by week to help us live our lives as followers of Christ. We thank you for all who work with our children in our church family and for bringing Kat to work among us. We pray that your Holy Spirit will guide her and lead her in her work and we ask for your blessing on her and her family as they make their home here among us. We are particularly thankful that we've been able to continue in our worship together over the last year, despite the many restrictions, and for the gifts and skills of those that have enabled this to happen. We thank you too for our six church wardens and all they do, and Lord, we pray that you will bless them and guide them in the many responsibilities they carry for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, let us pray for our communities and for ourselves. We pray, Lord, for all those who are anxious at this time, and we ask that they may know your peace. For those who are anxious about their health, their families and friends, their employment, finances or education. For those who are feeling isolated and lonely and who yearn to be able to meet friends and family again. And we pray for those who mourn and those who are sick and in a moment of silence we bring before God those known to us who are suffering. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them joy in your salvation. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. We join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. And now we sing our final hymn for this morning. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me.
And now the final blessing. Christ, give us grace to grow in holiness, to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us always. Amen. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. So we do hope that you've enjoyed this morning's service and will join us again next week. Next week is, of course, Easter Sunday, and our online service will be an all-age celebration of Easter. And there will, of course, be Easter Sunday services in all three of our churches at 10 o'clock in the morning. But there will be various other things going on before that for you to join in with if you wish. So let me just talk you through what our plans are for, for Holy Week and for Easter. And some of these are still being finalised. I'm actually having to record um, this, uh, this message a little earlier than usual because of our production schedule. So our plans are on Maundy Thursday evening at 7.30pm, uh, there will be a communion of the Last Supper at Wadhurst Church. And then on Good Friday, unfortunately, we aren't able to do our usual ecumenical walk of witness and Good Friday service. That, uh, that doesn't fit within COVID regulations at all. But what we will be doing instead in Wadhurst Church at 2pm, we'll be having a reflective service, which I've called an hour at the cross. Then on Easter Sunday morning, as I say, we'll have services at all three of our churches at 10 o'clock. We're also planning in parallel with that to have children's and family friendly activities outside. That seemed to work really well last week for, uh, for Mothering Sunday. So our plans are to have an Easter trail and an Easter egg hunt for families and children on Easter Sunday morning. But if it looks like the weather is going to be pretty unpleasant on Easter Sunday, we may move that to the Saturday, just so that that can uh, go ahead and be as enjoyable as possible. So I think that's, uh, that's all the details about Holy Week and Easter Sunday. I won't bother running through all the other notices at the end of the order of service, but I will just mention the prayer ministry is, as always, on offer on Sunday morning, 10.45 to 11.30. And this week it's with Sarah. So do give her a call if you would like to be prayed for or if there's someone or something for which you would appreciate prayer. And so until next time, whether it's in church or online, keep safe, keep well and keep in touch. God bless.